Hi everyone, recently I have been taking apart a broken auto transformer, and my attention was drawn to this ancient voltmeter made in the 1960s. What's interesting about this voltmeter is that its scale glows quite brightly in ultraviolet light, and it has an afterglow too. I'm curious to know what chemicals this device scale is coated with, and whether or not I can make this chemical myself. Well, let's find out. By the way, have you ever wondered what you can spend 50 minutes every day on with great benefit? I have one great answer that you will definitely love. Blinkist is a unique application that aims to develop you, and with pleasure. No one wants to spend precious time reading non-fiction and documentaries, and even more so if you are busy working or studying at the university. Blinkist will do everything for you, and all you have to do is set aside 15 minutes a day to improve your horizons. Agree, because this is quite a bit. The application offers you unique and very diverse content, more than 5,500 titles in 27 different categories. You don't Load the app, turn on your favorite team, and that's it. You can listen to books in excellent voice acting and read motivational articles and share with friends, and do all this on the way to work, university, or just on vacation. For example, I decided to read and listen to the legendary Dune Cycle by Frank Herbert. I had never looked through it before, but now there is in such opportunity, and it's gorgeous. I have already read half of the classic Dune, there are three more books ahead, I recommend it. And with the new Blinkist Connect feature, you can use each premium plan with two accounts at once, at no extra cost. It can be your spouse, friend or relative, anyone you want to develop with. I think this is a very good deal. Get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your 7 day free trial by clicking the link in the description. Thanks Blinkist for sponsoring, check link below to subscribe. I think many of you have often seen various objects glowing in darkness, whether that be a keychain, dial hands or an evacuation map in some hotel. Oftentimes they are all coated with or soaked in fluorescent powder consisting of zinc sulfide activated by copper, which is why when illuminated with ultraviolet light, this chemical can glow bright green and it has an afterglow too. This phenomenon is called fluorescence and was discovered by Nikola Tesla in the late 19th century. That's why this phenomenon is not new at all. In the early 20th century, after the discovery of radium, zinc sulfide was mixed with a radioactive radium chloride powder, which is why the obtained mixture could glow on its own as a result of beta and gamma rays emitted by radium atoms. But still such a constant light emitting mixture wasn't safe, because it flakes over time and begin to pose a health risk. This is why by the 1970s it was substituted with simple zinc sulfide based luminophore. It's fairly easy to obtain technical purity zinc sulfide. You just need to mix the right amounts of metallic zinc powder with sulfur and ignite the mixture. After that, you can watch these chemicals burn beautifully. However, zinc sulfide obtained in such a way won't glow because it contains a large amount of impurities. It takes much more effort to create a real luminophore than the process of ignition. After a quick search, I found out that Nigel from the Nile Red channel did this experiment not long ago. In his video, he describes the detailed process of obtaining zinc sulfide based luminophore. You can find a link to this video in the description. This is why, in order not to repeat the same thing, I decided to make a slightly different and more modern kind of luminophore, especially taking into account the fact that our 100 years have passed since Nikola Tesla's discovery, and there have been discovered more effective and newer analogs of zinc sulfide based luminophores. I decided to start the synthesis of modern luminophores with a regular aluminum foil, and first of all, I need to obtain aluminum nitrate from it. But it's not that easy to synthesize this chemical, because when aluminum is added to concentrated nitric acid, no reaction takes place, because of the process called passivation, which is formation of protective oxide film on the surface of the metal. That's why, first, I am dissolving 1 gram of aluminum foil in 20 ml of hydrochloric acid. Aluminum reacts much more actively with this acid. 
After that, I'm pouring in about 15 milliliters of concentrated nitric acid. This causes the solution to create quite a hardcore mix, consisting of nitrosyl chloride and other chemicals that are also present in aqua regia, that is able to dissolve gold. Nevertheless, I need to synthesize aluminum nitrate from this orange mixture. That's why I'm just heating a beaker with the mixture on a stove for several hours, until the nitrosyl chloride breaks down into nitrogen dioxide and hydrochloric acid, and until I get pure aluminum nitrate in the solution. Calling is pure is an exaggeration through. The obtained solution may be about 95% aluminum nitrate, and most probably the rest is iron impurities and other metals from the foil. To synthesize alumina 4, all chemicals must be at least 99.9% .9 pure, that's why for my next experiments I'll have to purify do-it-myself reagent thoroughly. To do that I decided to use a method called recrystallization, but first I need to dry the obtained solution in my do-it-yourself desiccator in order to deposit iron oxides. To do that, I am pouring in sodium hydroxide granules into one part of the desiccator, which is alkali, that will absorb moisture and leftover acids in the solution, and also create very dry air inside that will speed up drying of my solution. It took our a month to completely dry the aluminum nitrate, and during this time, part of sodium hydroxide turned into sodium nitrate because of the vestiges of nitrogen dioxide in the solution which is why even the container itself grew yellowish. Now I am dissolving aluminum nitrate in water again, in order for some compounds to deposit, and after that it will be easy to filter them out, using a regular filter, thus making the reagent purer. After filtering, I am putting the aluminum nitrate solution into the desiccator again, for a month or even longer, in order for it to dry properly and form white aluminum nonahydrate crystals, which are molecules of aluminum nitrate connected with 9 molecules of water in the form of such crystals. For now, purity of this reagent isn't sufficient for synthesizing alumina 4, that's why I decided to purify the substance again using a recrystallization. In the meantime, in order to do that, I prepared several sets of raw aluminum nitrate that I'm going to dissolve in a small amount of hot water. It turned out that some sets of aluminum nitrate contained impurities, perhaps as a result of hydrolysis in the moist air, which is why the solution grew slightly murky when it was heated. I had to filter this hot solution of aluminum nitrate again several times, before it became as pure as teardrop which is a good sign, showing the purity of this region. What's left to do is just to put the solution in the refrigerator for a couple of days, until the excess crystals of highly pure aluminum nitrate sink to the bottom, whereas all the impurities stay in the upper layer of the solution. Now I'm draining the upper layer of the solution and I'm putting the obtained aluminum nitrate crystals in the desiccator to sit for a month until they're half dried completely. Well, just four months later, I got highly pure aluminum nonahydrate crystals, having purity of about 99.9% .9 that are ready to be used for synthesizing luminophores. What's left to do is just to prepare four more reagents, and I will be ready to obtain the newest kind of luminophores. Even though I love chemistry, I have neither strength nor time to spend several more months in order to prepare all the remaining chemicals, that's why I decided to just buy them from trusted suppliers who sell pure reagents. As a result, one month later, I received all the deliveries of the required amounts of the needed chemicals of high purity. And the first reagent I will need to synthesize alumina 4 is urea. No, this is not the same urea that comes out of your body every day, rather this is urea synthesized at a factory, used in filterizers, and this is the only reagent the purity of which isn't very important for synthesizing luminophores. After urea, I am using the pure powdered aluminum nitrate nonhydrate that I have obtained. Besides these chemicals, I'll also need pure strontium nitrate. You can see the required amount of this as well as the other chemicals on your screen. After that goes boric acid, only a small amount of it is needed. Now go exotic regions, such as europium nitrate, and we need only 11 mg of it, as well as 22 mg of dysprosium nitrate. I used an analytical balance to weight such micro amounts, because regular scales will be too inaccurate. 
So after rating all the reagents, it's time to synthesize the alumina for itself and it's quite easy. First I'm pouring all the chemicals into one bottle and then I'm dissolving them in 2 ml of distilled water while heating the mixture. After dissolving the chemicals, I'm adding urea and stirring it until it dissolves completely. Once the solution has become transparent, I pour it into a big beaker and put it on a stove, waiting until the content starts boiling. As soon as the solution starts boiling, I'm setting my stove to maximum heat in order to start so-called pure synthesis. As a result of this process, nitrates from the solution oxidize the urea and also react with each other, forming an unusual chemical which is strontium aluminate, activated by europium and dysprosium. Once the reaction is over, what's left in the beaker is only strontium aluminate white flakes, which is a new kind of luminophore that can emit light several times longer than zinc sulfide. But at that time I didn't have an ultraviolet light source in my laboratory, that's why we will test the quality of the obtained luminophore a bit later. Besides parasynthesis on a regular stove, some scientific articles spoke about obtaining strontium aluminate using a regular microwave oven, because it's easier to control its temperature and improve the product quality. That's why I decided to test this method and prepared one more solution for synthesizing luminophore. I put it into a beaker and put the beaker into a microwave oven. It's noteworthy that this time luminophore formed even faster and at the end the nitrate reaction in the solution containing urea even produced a spark. After obtaining luminophores, I decided to check whether or not I have got something decent. To do that I pointed ultraviolet light at the obtained mixture and this is when a miracle happened. It worked out. I can clearly see a bright green glow in the beaker stained by the mixture. To run the final test, I transferred my do-it-yourself luminophores into bottles and pointed a powerful ultraviolet torch at them. They are glowing quite brightly, but it's also clear that some parts of the luminophore flakes don't glow or have a very short afterglow. By the way, in my opinion, the right bottle with a luminophore made in a microwave oven glows a bit longer, although not much longer. Of course, if you compare my samples with strontium aluminate luminophores made at factories, the difference in glowing is huge. That's because of the special method of obtaining commercial luminophores. Their synthesis happens in inert atmosphere in special ovens that cost ten of thousands of euros. This kind of newest luminophore was invented in the 1990s in Japan. If we compare the afterglow of factory-made as well as do-it-yourself strontium aluminate luminophores with zinc sulfide, then we will see that the time of its afterglow doesn't compare with the afterglow of time of even Chinese-made strontium aluminate luminophores. For one more test I bought a more high quality luminophore from the USA and decided to compare it to the previous samples again. As we can see the Chinese luminophore does fall behind in terms of the afterglow time. It's worth of note that besides green it's also possible to make zinc sulfide and strontium aluminate based luminophores of many different colors by changing their content and additives. Thus you can create an entire palette. Also green luminophores still have the longest afterglow. Of course it's good that these glowing powders glow beautifully in the dark, but what other use do they have besides being used in clock hands and keychains? New electroluminescent panels is one of the most interesting uses of such luminophores and you can easily order them from China. It works on the electroluminescence principle, which means it releases photons under the influence of electric current. That's why it can be very thin and light. It's quite easy to make a small sheet of such a panel, even in amateurish conditions. To do that, first of all, I bought special conductive glass. Each one side is coated in fluorinated tin oxide 
and if we touch it with multimeter test pins, then it will show that there is slight resistance on the glass. The first stage of making electroluminescent panel is creating a coating on the conductive glass with the help of tape. After that, I'm mixing a gram of copper activated zinc sulfide and gram of regular two part epoxy resin in a small container. Then I give it a good stir. Before the epoxy resin has hardened, I'm applying a thin layer of the obtained mixture on the glass with a blade. I'm making sure that the thickness of this layer is the same as the thickness of the tape, which is about 50 micrometers. Thus, I'm creating something like a capacitor, in which conductive glass is a transparent electrode, whereas the luminophore layer in epoxy resin is a dielectric, that is a substance that doesn't conduct electric current. In order to make a second electrode, I put a special conductive strip coated in conductive adhesive manufactured by the 3M company. It's important to use this very strip because copper tape of other manufacturers didn't work because their adhesives are not conductive and aren't suitable for this experiment. After firmly sticking the tape on the EL panel, everything is almost ready. We just need to turn on this device. I'm going to use a regular lighter piezoelectric cell as my electricity source. It produces voltage of around 3000 volts for several microseconds. If I connect this piezoelectric cell to a white light emitting diode, then I can light it up for a short time just using the force of my fingers. When the piezoelectric cell is connected to my EL panel, we can see a green spark for just a moment. It forms when this do-it-yourself capacitor discharges and its leakage turns into pure light. By the way, it was about 90 years ago that this phenomenon called electroluminescence was discovered. Unfortunately, such electroluminescent panel doesn't work for a long time. And it takes just several snaps of the piezoelectric cell for this thin layer of luminophore to burn out, causing a disruption which is quite bright. In contrast to my do-it-yourself sample, such more efficient strontium sulfide-based luminophores or luminophores based on other compounds, for instance such as zinc sulfide activated by manganese, are used in such electroluminescent panels. Such devices are several times more durable than light-emitting diodes or OLED displays. However, because of their low energy efficiency and high price for now, such devices are used only in expensive cars and extremely niche electric appliances. So we have found one use of zinc sulfide based luminophores. What's left to do is to find an interesting way to use strontium aluminate based luminophores. And there is one. In recent research, Japanese scientists noticed that if you coat some firm object in paint with this luminophore, then it will start glowing when twisted. I decided to test this unusual property of strontium aluminate. To do it, I mixed it with regular construction silicon sealant in equal amounts. After that, I spread it on a teflon coated baking sheet, because I thought that silicon sealant wouldn't stick to it. After hardening, it did stick and even began to glow under the light of a powerful fluorescent lamp. It glowed quite brightly in the dark, but I still cannot see it glow when I twist it. Evidently, I need to wait several hours until the afterglow ends. To be on the safe side, I decided to wait 24 hours, and as we can see, the silicon doesn't glow anymore. I can start twisting it slightly. Interestingly enough, in complete darkness, I do see that this lumina for silicon glows a little when twisted. It means that it releases slight photons when mechanical force is applied to it. It's an extremely unusual phenomenon, and it's called mechanochromic luminescence. It's a pity zoo that several minutes later, silicon itself starts glowing slightly, which is why the released light is not as visible. Such an unusual property of strontium aluminate based luminophores can be used to detect defects when some constructions, for instance, such as bridges and buildings, get deformed. The Japanese have also recently released an article about it. I decided to repeat these experiments and they made a ball from the same strontium aluminate based silicon with luminophores. After it hardened, I attempted to make it glow by hitting it against the table, but the light was either too dim or it doesn't work like that. But when such a ball is lighted by ultraviolet light, it turns into a rather unusual toy for several minutes.
Well, I think after watching this video, you'll know more about different luminophores and how to synthesize them, and also about their applications. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting. Thanks Blinkist for sponsoring, check link below to subscribe.